Hey you, I'm so glad you joined me today on the Teen Anxiety Maze. Now we have been working on the book, Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents. Well, we talked about that we need to expect to worry. And we've talked about talking to our worry as if it was a person or a character. So this week we're going to be talking about, we just need to be willing to be uncertain and uncomfortable in our lives <laughs> because the big picture, the world, our lives are full of uncertainty. We never know what's going to happen in the future. Now, I know there are some people that like to tell us that they can tell us the future. And sometimes people get lucky in telling us the future that things that they say were going to happen do happen. But our brain likes to try to predict the future in very negative, scary ways. And then when we think about those things, we're like, oh my gosh, I can't stand that. I, it would be so terrible if that happened. And then that stops us from doing things that we really want to do. Sometimes that uncertainty is about we want things to be perfect and we can't guarantee they're going to be perfect. So we don't want to do them. Or it can just be, we don't want to make the wrong decision, or we don't want to choose the wrong job, or we don't want to choose the wrong major. We don't want to choose the wrong partner. So we just don't do any of these things because we're afraid of that uncertainty, but we have to be willing to be uncertain and we have to be willing to be uncomfortable when we do new things. And so this episode is just about being willing to feel all of that yucky feelings inside and still do things and to allow some risk in our life. Now, I'm not talking about doing dangerous, life-threatening things. I don't like to do those things either. And I am not a physical risk taker, hardly at all. Like I just don't I like my body working the way it does. And I don't do anything. I don't even play pickleball because I am afraid of getting hurt. And I'm, that might be the opposite of what I'm talking about today. But I just feel like I don't really care if I play pickleball anyway. I mean, it kind of looks like fun, but I'm not an athlete. I'm not good at athletic things. So I probably wouldn't be good at it anyway. But emotional risks, and that's what I'm really asking you to push yourself with today I am all about emotional risks. I constantly take emotional risks and they always, well, they, I, can't, I can't say they always turn out right, but they always get me in a new direction and get me the things that I want eventually if I'm willing to do those emotional risks. Being an entrepreneur is one big, huge risk all the time, emotionally anyway. And I am glad that I'm taking this risk. I am proving to myself that I can do things I never thought I could do. I'm proving to my family that I can do things I never thought I could do. And I'm being a role model to my clients that you can do emotionally risky things and enjoy your life. I think whenever you're wanting to ask an, a romantic partner out for a date or go on a date, there's a lot of emotional risk with that. But oh, thank goodness we do it because we get in amazing relationships. Sometimes we don't. I've had my share of not amazing relationships, but the one I'm in now is absolutely perfection. And I had to be, I had to do emotional risk in order to have this relationship. So I want you to be willing to be uncomfortable and to risk yourself emotionally. And I've done other podcasts about this. You can look back and, um, look at some of the titles and figure out which ones were about emotional risk. But this is so important to do because this is, I think this is the secret to success in our lives. And if so, if you are dreaming about being a successful person in the world, you have to be uncomfortable and you have to have emotional risks. There are bad things that happen in this world. There are bad people. There are accidents. There are there are so many things that can happen. And I know that it's scary. I think about those things too. Being a parent means that you're, I think that I signed up for worry the rest of my life. Well, I did sign up for worry the rest of my life. And then they had kids. So now I have grandchildren and then the worry intensifies. There are every day, I probably have like this thing flash before my mind about some terrible thing happening. And then I'm like, no, 
that is not how I'm going to live my life. I'm not going to let anxiety and worry and fear control the things that I do or the places that I go or the people that I love. I'm just going to realize that that's part of it. Of course, our brain worries about bad things happening. Our brain is trying to keep us safe and probably everyone else safe in our lives. And I totally get that. But I'm not going to let it stop me from doing things that I that I want to do. We, we try to our brain and our body tries to prepare us for to be safe by telling us not to do a lot of things. Now, some of those things we do need to pay attention to, you know, we don't want to walk out in the street without looking. We don't want to not wear a seatbelt. We don't want to not wear a helmet when we're skateboarding or riding our bike or a motorcycle. I mean, there are things that we need to prepare for to keep us as safe as we can be. But then after that, we need to not worry about having like these rituals and routines that are supposed to keep everybody safe and keep us safe from doing all these things. You know, if you listen to my daughter's story in a a previous episode where she talked about her anxiety, when she was in elementary school, she got, she became fearful and having panic attacks that I was going to die. And in her mind, her mind told her that if she was physically with me, then I couldn't die. So she, when she was at school and we were separated because I went to work and she was at school, she was on edge the whole time because she wasn't with me and I could die. But as soon as she came home and I came home and we were in the house together, then she was fine because, oh, well, my mom is with me and now she can't die. Now, of course, that's not true. And we didn't talk about that like, oh, I didn't remind her every day. Oh, by the way, I could die even if I'm in this house or I could die even if we're in the car together or whatever. Like that's <laughs> like too much information. But she created this whole ritual in her mind that if we were together, I couldn't die. So then she didn't want to go away from me because that was upsetting. And I really wonder if that isn't why she was throwing up before school every day, because she had that fear of, well, when I go to school, then my mom's in danger. Or when I spend the night with a friend, my mom's in danger because I'm not with her. And I remember trying to talk her through that, probably not always in the best ways, because a lot of it was like, oh, don't worry about it. Well, that's crazy. Why would you think that? And that's not how we help our kids deal with their anxiety. But I didn't know any different at that time. And so that was just like, oh, well, don't worry about it. And it's totally fine. Anxiety demands certainty and comfort from us. And so anytime we're doing anything out of the ordinary, it it's telling us that we need to be certain and we need to be comfortable. But in order to grow and become independent people, we have to be uncertain and we have to be uncomfortable. So the more that you can teach your children and teach yourself, because I still have to remind myself to not get caught up in all of those terrible things that can happen and just move forward. So we need to be teaching courage, which is going into something, even when we feel afraid and uncomfortable and uncertain and just do the thing anyway. And it's very important to look at your own behavior. If you're a parent, a teacher, a school counselor, you know, whoever is in charge of kids, that you're not showing how anxiety is holding you back. You can role model and talk through. I mean, don't, don't tell your children or these people that you're supervising that you're not afraid of things or that you never worry about anything because that's not true. But when you do worry, talk about how you acted anyway, how you, what you did to get through that and move forward. And you could model how you talk to your anxiety so that it, you can talk yourself down from those anxious feelings and how you're going to go forward anyway. Just look for ways to support and normalize when your child does do reasonable, uncomfortable risks, when they talk to the teacher, when they're, they were afraid to do it, when they learn to drive a car, when they take a new class, when they go on their first day of school, when they 
choose to have a new friend or whatever it is that they're doing that where there's a reasonable amount of risk and uncomfortableness, praise them for it, support them, talk about, it, celebrate how they are doing courageous things that will help them to realize that they can handle anything that the world throws at them. That doesn't mean that we want bad things to happen or that we would not care if bad things happened. It just means that if bad things happened, we could handle it. I remember telling my daughter when she was worried about me dying in a plane crash because we were, um, her dad and I were going to go on a trip and she didn't want us to go because we were going to be in a plane and she didn't like it. And I'm thinking this was probably around 9-11 when she saw all sorts of TV coverage of planes crashing all the time. And I said, I can't guarantee you any day that I'm not going to die, but I promise you that if I did die, you are going to handle it. And there are so many people who love you and they're going to take care of you and they're going to help you figure out what to do. And yes, you would be sad. And yes, you wouldn't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. I plan to live a long time, but you, you will handle it and people will help you handle it and people love you and will take care of you. And she said that that was comforting when she would think about her grandparents who were my parents who lived in our town, like 15 minutes away. She knew those, I think my mom was actually going to be with her that week that we were gone because she had school and she was going to help her go to school and take her to school and make her lunch or whatever the things were that needed to happen that week. And I remember her she said later, yes, that was comforting to know that I am going to be taken care of. People love me and I could live without my mom. I just don't want to. And of course, we don't want those things to happen, but we will survive it and we will learn ways to manage it. So those are things that you could talk to your kids about. Whatever their worry is, you will handle this no matter what happens. And just help them problem solve situations. They do need to be taught these skills. It's not like the first time they're anxious, you just say, well, you're going to handle it. See you later. You do have to talk them through it. You have to help them understand how this works. Talk through these different steps that we're doing in this series and explain to them how they work. And then you are helping them kind of wean off of your help. And then they are doing it on their own. You know, I talked last time about how anxiety can be crippling and it definitely can be crippling, paralyzing, however you want to look at it. And so then we give crutches to our kids or to ourselves to help us through situations. Now, crutch, crutches can be good because like when you're rehabilitating from an injury, you need to keep the weight off of something for a while so it can heal. So when toddlers are growing up and they might need a nightlight or a security blanket or a special stuffed animal when they go to bed or whatever. All of that is a fine crutch as they're learning how to be more independent in the dark, more independent when they go to sleep, more independent when they go into new situations. I think about babies with pacifiers, you know, you have them do because the, they need to be comforted and that is a comforting item for them as a baby, but you don't let them have it their whole lives. There's a, a, there's a weaning off of that. And so when you think about crutches, you want to think about if you're, if you're creating all of these comfortable things, like as they go to school, you have all these different rituals and schedules and things in place, you might want to think about when is it just like a transition and you're weaning off of something or when is it like, this is the status quo, the way we're always doing it, and they're never like trying anything to be uncomfortable. You have to put that risk and that uncomfortableness in the plan. And so they have to be, it has to be something, whether you're doing it at home or it's something that the school is doing, it has to be something that, yes, we're going to do this while you have this level of anxiety, but then we're going to try this X amount of time or X amount of situations. And then, then we're going to go to the next risky level and you're going to try that. Then you're going to do until they're totally independent doing the thing that they're supposed to do. Don't leave those crutches around too long because then they become too dependent on them. So you have to think about 
how can you know if it's too much or not? When the accommodations, when they are more worried about safety and security than they are about doing fun things, then that means that there's been too many crutches and too much comfortableness put into the plan. They need to be able to do some emotionally risky things. So there are some actions that your teen or your child needs to be taking. One of those is that they must be, they must want to learn these new ways of responding. Now, at first they're not going to want to, because if you've made things so comfortable, they've never been uncomfortable. They don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to be uncomfortable. And when they are throwing fits about us making them do a, uncomfortable, risky things, that makes us uncomfortable. And we don't want that either, but you're going to have to get through that. And at some point they will want to do some of these things because they're not going to want to be in their room the rest of their lives. Now they think they do sometimes because it feels safe in there, but they really are missing out and they know they're missing out on friends and parties and driving and, you know, what, whatever the things are, dating, learning new things, going to school, whatever. And so once they start realizing that those things are options for them, they don't have to always be crippled by it, then they will start to want to respond, but you've got to push them into that uncomfortable zone. And they need to do things that stimulate a little bit of fear in them. And you can start with some really small steps. You know, as I taught this in one of, to some of my clients, it's like when you start a video game, you don't start out an expert level usually. Now, some people are really good at them, uh, but usually you have to start at level one and you have to learn the skills that it takes to play that game so that you can get to expert level. And that's what we're doing with our kids. We're giving them these little uncomfortable, emotionally risky situations. And we need to start that really early. And even if you haven't, even if you've been one of those parents that took all the uncomfortableness away, you can still teach this. It's just going to, they're going to be more resistant to it and they're going to be probably fighting you somewhat through it as you make them do these uncomfortable things. They need to be able to allow that uncomfortableness in their body and go forward anyway. And I teach that in my program and I've taught it here in this, in these podcast episodes. So you can go back and listen to some of those and they need to be able to tolerate that uncomfortableness for a certain amount of time in their body. And you can help them practice with all of these things. And so once, once your child understands that they need to move forward and do risky things, they need to emotionally risky things, they need to be uncomfortable, they need to talk to their anxiety and talk themselves out of, talk their anxiety out of worrying about some of those situations so much, letting their body respond and just feel the uncomfortableness, your lives are going to improve so quickly once you get to that point. And I know that that's the hard part and anything that's worth doing, you know, isn't going to be easy or not hard but you can do hard things and your child can do hard things. And as you practice these things and start rewiring their brain, they're going to start doing some amazing independent things and they're going to be so excited about it. So I can't wait to hear from you about what emotionally risky things you're trying, what emotionally risky things your child is trying. I'll talk to you soon.